to the processional. Our hymn for this morning is number 776, which is at the very back of the hymnal. Hymn 776, we will sing the first two verses together as we profess. Oh, for a thousand times to see my dear
they shall make captains of the army to lead the people. Here ends the Old Testament class. Now let us stand for the reading of the psalm. Our psalms for this morning are numbers 11 and 12. You'll find Psalm 11 on page 354 of the Book of Common Prayer. We will read the psalm responsibly, breaking at the after it. Psalm 11. In the Lord put I my trust. Have say ye then to my soul, that she should flee as a bird unto the dove. For lo, the ungodly bend their bow, and make ready their arrows with them to quiver. That they may privily shoot at them, which are true of heart. In the foundation, if the foundations be destroyed, what, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's seat is in heaven. His eyes consider the poor. And his eyes his children of him. The Lord proves the righteous.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. What would you say is the most important object in your home? Perhaps it's a family heirloom, or maybe it's one of your appliances, the refrigerator, or the coffee maker for me is pretty important. Or maybe it's your favorite chair. Well, for Christian families, since time immemorial, the most important object in the house has been the dinner table. As one Anglican priest once wrote, as long as the household lasts, the table remains the one thing that everybody uses the most, the one and often the only place where the family meets, in fact. The table is the guarantee that the household is a real society and not a legal fiction. All true societies are defined geographically, after all. The board stands as the published map of the family. The bed was our place of being for only a few minutes, but the table is our shared territory, literally, for years. The family table is also the holiest place in the house, if you think about it. 
It's where society begins. It's where you learn your manners, how to talk to others, care about their feelings and their space. It's where you learn what topics of conversation are appropriate and which ones are not. There are more rules at the table than at any other place in the house because it's there that a child begins to learn what the psalm says, how blessed it is when brothers dwell in unity. It doesn't matter how fancy or expensive the table is. If it's like ours, it's been handed down uh, and we've had it for years. It's not a very nice looking table. But no matter what it looks like, they all carry the same power. It's not just a convenient, convenient place to do paperwork or hold birthday parties, but a well-used table has the power to make societies. This idea of unity in society by table fellowship is a central plank of the Christian message. Today, Christ is reminding us of this fact, that he came to give us the Lord's table, whereon we might feast together on his eternal sacrifice, and by doing so, be transformed ourselves into a holy and loving society, even the family of God. We see this in our lesson from St. Luke's Gospel. In this chapter, Christ had been teaching the Pharisees about the blessings for those who are hospitable to the poor, those who share their table, in other words. Don't invite your family to your table, he tells them, but invite the poor. They cannot repay you. So your motivation will be pure, and your reward will be paid at the resurrection of the just. When one of the Pharisees replies affirmatively that only those who eat bread in the kingdom of heaven will be blessed, Christ tells them this parable. A certain man made a great supper and bade many. Now the supper, the supper represents the fellowship of God's people in the kingdom of heaven. The man who sends out the invitation is the father who sent his word to the people of Israel, who invited them to be his covenant people. Never mind the fact that they were the smallest, the weakest, the poorest nation in the world. God chose them, and so they were great and mighty because of him. They did not worship idols. Rather, they worshiped the true and living God who is a spirit, and all the nations around them were jealous of their freedom. The small kid in class often gets picked on, when, especially when he has stuff. David says, Thou preparest a table for me in the midst of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. The table is prepared, the feast is ready, and God himself will serve those who had only ever wanted to serve themselves. Notice the invitation does not have a time. We're not told when the kingdom of heaven will come. But those who are invited are expected to be ready when the announcement comes upon them suddenly. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. Those who were invited should have known when the feast was to occur, even though it didn't have a time on it, the invitation, for all the great feasts happen at supper time when the work of the day is done and the day's bounty is brought in and prepared to eat. The servant represents the Son of God who is sent out to tell the people of Israel that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He comes to call them home, but in doing so he calls them away from their worldly affairs. He calls them to feast even in the midst of their enemies, even while the fear of death threatens their livelihood, Christ prepares a feast. And he says, they all with one consent began to make excuse. It does seem a bit odd, doesn't it, to feast when things around you are dying, when chaos seems to be surrounding you? Now, they didn't hatch a plan to make excuses together. They don't have the same circumstances in common. Yet their refusal of the invitation was with one consent. They all are of one mind, and so they send their regrets to their Redeemer. They deny the invitation to leave this dead and dying world and their own dead works and to live. How could God's invitation to eternal life be so casually disregarded? It's almost humorous how ridiculous it is to refuse God's invitation. What would you write to him 
What would you say to the servant? Dearest Lord, Heavenly Father, John sends his deepest regrets that he will not be able to come to the kingdom of heaven at this time. It's a ridiculous thought. And yet, aren't we all guilty of sometimes tuning out the sound of God's call, sending him our regrets? The parable says, The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Now, none of these activities demanded so much of their time that they could not put them on hold for one night. The most important feast of their life has been laid before them, and they simply don't think it's that important. The flaming swords of the seraphim that barred the way into the Garden of Eden have been temporarily extinguished for them, and yet they would rather be inflamed with the desires of the world than walk with God in the cool of the day. In our Old Testament lesson from Deuteronomy, we're told that God did excuse certain men from going to holy war, one of them being the excuse of recent matrimony. If, if a man was recently married, he may be excused from battle. And this was to show that God had mercy on the newlywed. But there is no mercy and there are no excuses for those who refuse the invitation to this heavenly feast. This is not just any old battle. This is the battle of life or death. This is what the book of Revelation calls the marriage supper of the Lamb. In this feast, the Son of God himself is the meal, his body and his blood, the life-giving fountain. This table is not our table, it's the Lord's table, the altar of the temple of heaven, and upon it stands the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You know, it's interesting to me that in the Old Testament, the altar is called the table of the Lord. Even though it's not a table, you can't sit at it and eat from it. You'll get burned. It was a place of putting sacrifices so that they were consumed in fire. It's God who eats at that table. In the New Testament, God comes to the table with us, and we sit down with him, and he treats us like friends. Now after this, the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quietly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those that were bidden shall taste of my supper. Those Israelites, in other words, who were invited and refused the invitation, those Israelites were to be judged because God's house must be full, because his house, his holy temple, must reflect his own infinite goodness, the overflowing bounty of his love. It must be a full house. And so the Lord calls everyone, even compelling the homeless, the nameless, those who had never set foot in a proper house, never reclined at a proper table, they all must be compelled to come in. Our epistle lesson warns us, though. It says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. In other words, don't be surprised when those who were originally invited show up at the door and demand entrance. And don't be surprised when they hate you, though you are poor, though you are a homeless beggar, and they will hate you especially because you are poorer than them. Don't be surprised that they hate you for taking their place. For Jesus says, indeed, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I am not come to send peace, but a sword. It was those false prophets that Jeremiah said cried, peace, peace, when there was no peace. The table that God sets for us will always be that table set in the midst of our enemies. And yet in the midst of our enemies, our cup overflows. 
And God anoints us with the healing oil of gladness. And yet, how can it be good that this table, this, the peace that this table and the feast brings between heaven and earth, how is it good when it provokes envy and the hatred of the world? If it's such a healing table, how is it provoking anger? Well, how is the sacrifice of Abel better and more acceptable to God and provoking the anger of Cain? The murderous and evil intent shown to us by our brothers and sisters is a choice made from their own corrupt and wicked hearts. God is not the author of sin. God is the author of grace. What Christ is saying is that his sacrifice for us and the meal that he gave to us will cause the wicked to envy us, our joy, our gladness that we have in our hearts as we know the love of God for sinners. Many will envy that knowledge, knowledge of the truth about who we are, the truth that God made us male and female, and that it's a good and proper thing for a man to leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. We hold these truths with confidence. Some will hate us because of our confidence in these things, but others will listen. Others will desire, like us, to come to that table. For by the grace of God, many will recognize themselves as sinners and beggars. These will not make excuses, and they will exchange the proclamation of false peace to the world for that peace which passes all understanding. Indeed, Christ came to bring a sword, and that sword is the word of God, which St. Paul tells us is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Today, Christ is calling us to the feast. But in order to receive his invitation, we must be willing to receive the word of God that pierces the heart. We must be willing for that word and that feast to transform us into a new creation, even the image of God. For those who dine at this table are born again as the servants of God, who God then sends out into the world with that word of invitation to the poor, to the weak, and to the lame. Those who eat of this table of mercy, in other words, become table makers themselves. This is why hospitality has always been one of the principal Christian virtues. Hospitality literally means the nourishing of a stranger. I recently heard the conversion story of Dr. Rosaria Butterfield. She was a tenured professor at a prestigious university, a feminist and a lesbian. She was one of the leading voices in proclaiming postmodern philosophy to the next generation. And she was working on a book that would refute the truths of Christianity. Now, after writing an article in which she criticized a local evangelistic network, a local Presbyterian pastor sent her a kind letter. Out of all the letters she received that weren't kind, she received a kind letter from a Presbyterian minister. Rosaria says she accepted this invitation. It wasn't a letter of rebuke, but an invitation to dine at his table to discuss matters of faith. She accepted the invitation because she thought he might be a good test subject for her research. But what happened at that minister's house that night began to change her life. For the minister and his wife did not attempt to convert her, or even to try to bring her to church. They didn't make her feel unwanted or judged. Instead, they talked with her like civilized people. And after dinner, the minister took her by the hand, and with a smile on his face, he thanked her for coming, and invited her to come again the next week. She didn't leave his house that night a Christian, but she did leave knowing that she had made a friend. Now, after many months of coming to his house for dinner, the Lord worked in Rosaria's life, and she eventually was given the courage to walk through the doors of the church and to worship. Today, she travels the country giving her testimony about how the Lord changed her life through a simple four-legged piece of furniture and the kindness of a friend. Beloved, if the God who made all things has invited us poor beggars to his table, 
then we too should invite the poor, the lonely, and even those who we'd consider to be enemies to sit at our table and to dine with us. When you think of your faith, how often do you think of the word hospitality? Did you know that hospitality is something that Christ requires of you? Indeed, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And to some he will say, I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. How often do we expect to find Jesus Christ in the face of a stranger? Indeed, St. Paul says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. <clears throat> now you may say, because we are prone to make excuses, as our parable says, well, you know, if I heard of a stranger in my neighborhood, then I would be willing to invite them to dinner or to make a meal for them. But that's not what Christian hospitality looks like. Yeah, that's a good thing, but that's not the whole picture. True hospitality does not wait for the needy to come to the door. Rather, true hospitality lives in imitation of Jesus Christ, who did not wait for us to come to him, for indeed we could not come, because we were weak, we were ignorant, and we were separated from God. Beloved, Christ is telling us today that true hospitality goes out into the highways and the hedges and compels all kinds of people to come in, for the Lord's house must be full. The table is a more powerful means of evangelism than anything else in our gospel toolkit. And yet how little use do we make of this powerful tool that God has given us? Though it's difficult, and though you're probably all thinking this, it is impossible, even, to entertain guests in the midst of a pandemic. But yet now is the time to start preparing for hospitality, to repent even for failing in this regard, and vowing to open up our houses to our neighbors as the Lord commands. Now is the time to reassess our lives and our homes, to prepare for what we will do when the pandemic is over. Indeed, one of the good things about this pandemic is that it forces us to reassess our lives, to ask ourselves how we can be better neighbors to those who do truly need a friend. People are really good at hiding their pain, but there are a lot of people in pain out there. All we have to do to, is invite them to find that out. Christ wants all of us to start planning for that day because our society our society will crumble apart from the good news of Jesus Christ. And your table has the power to rebuild society. And so as we come to the Lord's table, to his altar, whether we're here in body or here in spirit, let us come with the conviction and determination to leave this place today in a different state of mind than when we came. For this table will change us if we truly accept the Lord's invitation. Let us come here with gladness in our hearts and joyful expectation for what God will do here for us and in us even today. For here is the marriage supper of the Lamb and the full house of God Almighty, to whom be all glory and honor both now and forever. Amen.
pray for the whole state of Christ's church. Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy apostles hath taught us to make prayers and supplications, and to give thanks for all men, we humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept our oblation, and to receive these our prayers, and to offer unto God our majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word, and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also so to direct and dispose the hearts of all Christian rulers, that they may truly and impartially administer justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice, and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, Set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacrament. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with deep heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear. Beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service and to give us grace so to follow their good example, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. <laughs> ye who do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbors, and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God, to walk ye from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith, and take this holy sacrament to your comfort. Make your humble confession to Almighty God, devoutly kneeling. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by God.
suffered death upon the cross for our redemption, who made thereby his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And in institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night of which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he prayed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood in the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we thy humble servants do celebrate and make dear before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and the blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And all those here are unworthy, through our manifold sins, to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this, our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Oh, and I'm a God. 
body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for thee. Preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in thy heart by faith, and with thanks for it.
to him that loved us and washed us from our own sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen.